Welcome into your Friday edition of Dropping Dimes uh, NBA playoff basketball op action in the Orlando bubble. I'm your host, Matt Knows, and I'm joined by longtime friend and fellow NBA diehard enthusiast, Mr. Mark Fernandez. How are you, sir? I'm pretty good, man. I'm pretty blown away by that intro music, man. That was uh, that's pretty intense. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to get a copyright strike on that or not. I guess I'll find out in due time. Uh, that was cool, though. That was cool. It's good yeah. to see you, Matt. It's good to see you, buddy. It's good to see you, too. How's your uh, how's quarantine? How's uh, Collider? Things are good, man. Things are good. Quarantine has been a pain. You know, um, it's been a whole new world. And, you know, we can talk about that for five days. But, um, yeah. yeah, it's been good. Overall, things are good. I can't complain. Um, I try to keep as positive as possible and, you know, just move forward. Well, that's good. That's all you really can do in this day and yeah, age. It's that's just really it. One day at a time and uh, deal with what you can and just fucking let the rest roll off your back because you have no other choice in this matter. But, but look, I, I, um, I've had 75% of a good NBA week. So I, I'm feeling pretty good. You know, I thought I was going to pull off a four for four, but I, I got three. I'm pretty much three and one this week in the NBA, and that's pretty good. Who are you that. doing a little gambling? No, no, just my own sort of mental, uh, sort of pride. You know, I'm, 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 I'm having seventy five percent of a good week. You know, I had three games that I really enjoyed, and one game last night that by the third quarter I was like, why am I even still watching this? Uh, I think most of us did that. I turned it off. You know. In essence, once they pull the starters, it's like, all right, there's literally no point to watching this game. Yeah. And there's 10 minutes left and the starters are out. So I still yeah. check back in and whatnot, but I went on to do other things, hang out with my wife type stuff. It just like, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, that I, was a legit ass kicking. Fu- I mean, full on, yeah. full on ass kicking. I mean, the Blazers could not hit a shot to save their lives. Yeah. Freaking amazing. Yeah, Mello ends with you know two points. Dame goes out in the third with the dislocated finger. He's technically the high water mark for their scoring, and he had 18. It's not like he was blowing you know the doors off the place. No, but they just they shot poorly. It was it was piss poor. That's the lowest amount that they've scored, I believe, all season, which is 88 points. Wow. Yeah, the, I mean the Lakers defense is holding it. It was just game one, like the Lakers offense. KCP went 0 for 9 with one point from the free throw line. And last night he was lights out from three point land. Uh, LeBron had like an okay game 10 points, six boards, seven assists. But AD went off and then they got, you know, KCP for 16. And JR actually got some run and he got 11 points. And they just, they, they, they got production further down the line when they needed to. And uh, the Blazers could not hit a bucket. They were—I mean, it was just bad to watch. It's—it's—it's it's, it's really interesting to me because um, LeBron, LeBron is so much. He's—he's he's the first. And look, th- this might be a little bit of quarantine, uh, um, you know, sort of sort of quarantine lunacy or whatever, but. You know, we, we started quarantine with um, the uh, last dance. You know, we got we, we got the whole world got reintroduced to Michael Jordan um, and uh, his greatness and all that stuff, uh, which was a great documentary series. But it really like built this prototype of what the ultimate, you know, champion should look like, should act like, you know, his sort of alpha dog, all of those kind of things were really well defined in the last dance. Now you fast forward to the actual NBA playoffs in the bubble in this weird kind of new context. Um, but LeBron James is is bigger than the bubble. It seems like like he's he's held to different standards. Yes, than th- than every single other player um, in the bubble, and he's also a lot older. Than, than almost every other player in the bubble, right? I mean, if he's yeah. definitely in terms of, like, uh, seasons played, I wouldn't be surprised, and, and look, I don't know this for a fact, but I wouldn't be surprised if he has the most seasons played out of any active player in the bubble right now. So, 
I'd have to because you know Melo had that time off, so those lack of games. Melo's probably the closest. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. To LeBron, I'm trying to cycle through all the different rosters mm. of who. I mean, CP3 is right there with him, but D Wade is out. Yeah. Uh, so, he, so, so you know, my my point is is that he's bigger than the bubble. He's more experienced than anybody playing in the bubble. He's held to completely different standards than everybody else. So, he's essentially the coach and the player of the team. Yeah. Um, because I mean, you never hear about Vogel. You barely see him on the broadcast. Like you see Jason Kidd more than you see Vogel. Um, and then like the narrative last night was that LeBron James had this, you know, um, you know, that there was something going on behind the scenes, right? There's like there's all this drama percolating behind the scenes that he didn't want to blame, but could have had a result of why they lost game one. But last night, the narrative is that AD says, LeBron sat me down and gave me a talking to, and that's what sort of opened me up. And, you know, I was able to put the 31 points. So all the credit of the coaching is also going to LeBron. It's the, it's the way it's always been, though. I mean, Fair. it is... Do you think of Ty Lue as a good coach? I have no idea because LeBron was the coach of that team. But like, Ty Lue was definitely looked at as the coach, and he gets a lot of credit. Like they say, oh, Ty Lue's the hottest coaching candidate in the NBA right now. Um, he gets a lot of credit for coaching LeBron. I, I don't know. I think Spolstra is the only coach that you talk about in those regards. In LeBron, all his various tenures, Mike Brown doesn't get that respect. That's true. That's true. It's it's basically it's Spolstra, and then LeBron has been the coach and the GM, you know, well, in public opinion throughout his entire run of every franchise that he's been with. My my kind of end point with that whole thing is that that level of pressure and drama and ups and downs and having this kind of responsibility for the personalities um, and, and and basically the drama is once again, I think going to bite LeBron in the butt. And I don't know if they can sustain an entire playoff run with that level of drama. It's just like, I, it. I mean, look, look, I, I was there. You go from praising to the guy to, to <laughs> undercutting him once again, man. I love it. You look, stay, you're on message. If it nothing else, you are on message. Look, I was there for the AC drama. And, and, and look, I still credit Greg Popovich, uh, you know, for uh, for the smartest mental game or psychological warfare ever played on an athlete was the AC against LeBron. And like, how much of that is he? You know, you know now they're saying that the courts are too dark, that the you know that the sound is weird. It's like there's all of these external things I keep hearing around the Lakers that I really don't hear around any other team. You know, like the heat, you barely hear anything about them, you know, and like, yeah, but LeBron also brings eyes. So everybody has an opinion. The a, most it's the Lakers. The most yeah. Well, a, it's the Lakers, which is the most followed team in the league. Right. I would, I would assume, you know, quite, quite handily. And then you put the face of the NBA for the past 12 to 15 years. No but doubt. legitimately 12, 10 to 12 years where LeBron has been the marquee star year in and year out. Whatever team he's on is suddenly the one of the topic of discussion amongst all people. So they're going to get an undue amount of scrutiny and discussion and everybody. I've heard so many people with bad Laker takes uh, just because it's a team that they can follow and they understand. They know the name LeBron. They know the name Anthony Davis. So they can at least have a discussion. Uh, maybe it's not that well informed. That's fine, but at least they're having the discussion. I think that's unlike the Heat, where if you don't know Jimmy Butler, you don't know this team at all. There's, there's him and Spolstra. Spolstra is a bigger name than anybody else on the Heat to the general public. Right, and people don't even know Kendrick Nunn, um, who's like you know I, I think officially now a finalist for Rookie of the Year. Um, and he hasn't really been playing the you know these first few games. Yeah, zero um, minutes. Zero is, minutes for yeah. Uh, it just it's crazy a guy that is in the the rookie of the year discussion. He's not gonna win it, but he's in the discussion. He yeah. started fifty nine or so games. He's been 
the backbone I, of your offense in that, you know, your point guard is your your floor general. And then game one starts and Spolstra is like, listen, man, we got to put Dragic in there. He's been and playing good. He's he has well. been playing good. And yeah, yeah. It, it's, you know, the evidence t- proves, you know, the, the results prove the decision or fortify the decision. It's it's just crazy. Him and Myers Leonard, who started a ton of games at center, neither has played yet. And they're up 2-0. Now, it's not that surprising against the Pacers, just no Sabonis and, and you know, uh, Oladipo went out after eight minutes in game one and whatnot. But still, the if they don't hit from three by a specific, you know, percentage, I don't think they really have a chance in these games with the Heat just because, like, Duncan Robinson going white hot last night. Jimmy Butler, I love it, 26% from three this season. But in crunch, in rhythm, I believe he's now two for two in both the games, yeah. hitting these threes, you know, desperately when the Heat need it just to solidify the win. And that's the only time. It's smart. It's the only time he's shooting the three as opposed to Westbrook, who just, hey, if I'm open, I shoot. Just like, you're not a good three-point shooter. Maybe you should rethink that strategy. Right, right now, Jimmy Butler is the grassroots basketball hero. If you like sort of no-frills basketball and a guy who's just out there uh, who's very good and I think um, only really focused on basketball. I yeah. think you're hard pressed to find somebody um, that's sort of gained more fans than Jimmy Butler has to this process. Because Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons um, and Tobias Harris and that whole Philadelphia 76ers mess isn't really being covered as much anymore, right? Like those guys have kind of fallen way in the background. And even that Philly-Boston series that when you started the season, you could have imagined being the highest rated series in the East has kind of taken a little bit of like a, eh, you know. Honestly, I, it, from somebody who's watched. Especially on the Philly side. Yeah, who's watching it, precisely for that reason. A, with Ben Simmons out, but B, Embiid does, doesn't look like he wants to be there. Like he's trying. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah, but he's not giving – it doesn't look like he's giving 100% at all times, and everybody else appears to be doing it by and large. Um, and to watch him at certain points, like he's loafing. It's like, dude, the, this is the playoffs. There's no time for that. And now there's – you know, the discussion has always been, okay, if you break these up, who do you who do you send out? And in the past 48 hours, I've seen now the tide shift to maybe we move on from Embiid. Before that, I did most of it was <laughs> ship out in Sim- Simmons because you know he can play great defense, but he has no jumper. Even if he shoots a corner three, that's cute. But if he's not going to consistently do it, he's not a threat. And now the the you know the tone has shifted to maybe we move on from Embiid, but he's wrapped up on a contract till twenty twenty three through that season. Right. And the coach, I've also heard they're trying to get rid of the coach. As well. Oh, dude, he's. If they lose in the first round, he's done. Even if they make it to the second and they lose in the second, I think he's done. They have to make Eastern Conference finals slash finals for him to keep his job, and I just don't see that happening. So Brett Brown is going to be out as Philly's coach. Yeah. Pretty much guaranteed. Have, have you done your um, your brackets already? Have you already done your, your playoff prediction? Like, have you uh, made your official prediction? Well, we did it on the fly last week. Um, just got, the, you know, the – Matchups all got set, and then, uh, you know, we're recording a few hours later, me and, uh, you know, another guy, Mateen. Uh, but, yeah, I, I gave rough predictions. I So far, I am wildly incorrect about the OKC-Houston. I thought OKC might be, might have a chance to take it in seven. Uh, oh, really? Well, I figured it'd go back and forth and back and forth, but everybody was talking about Chris Paul has been so loud in the bubble that he has basically dominated the court mentally Uh, opposing teams more than one has said like Chris Paul is dictating the tone out there and our players are falling in line with basically what he's barking out. And that's not what we want. So you figure maybe this is the one year that Chris Paul has an advantage and he actually progresses at least past the first round. And uh, that with Westbrook sitting out, it's like, you're going to need a Herculean effort from, you know, Harden, but shit Harden and Gordon played pretty bad. And they still, yeah. in that last game, and they still, like, all, all of a sudden, Austin Rivers is dunking on people. and shooting points he had the other day? Um, let's see. I can pull it up. Yeah, he had 41 points oh, the other day. 
Yeah, yeah before the playoffs started. He had 11 yeah. the other night, but he shot three of six from three. He yammed it hardcore over two OKC players. But him, Jeff Green went three of six. McLemore went two of six. Daniel House, three of eight. P.J. Tucker, four of four. This is all from three. Covington right. shot 40%. Like, everybody else put in buckets and when I mean, Harden shot 18% from three and 31 from the floor. And Gordon went 0 for 10 from three. But they still won by 13 points. I mean, just crushed them. What, what, what's the uh, – what's the – Look, for me, one thing that it has been a little bit um, off-putting about quarantine basketball and the bubble and stuff is that I find it a little bit more difficult to get to get the latest um, news when it comes to injury updates um, mm -hmm. and, like, who's going to play here, who's not going to play there, even on the Heat. I mean, the Heat are such a revolving door of starting five. Starting five on the Heat, you could never predict it. It's like this weird – like almost like G League mentality. They'll throw anybody out there, and it's all this like system that they've built um, around defense and three point shots. I mean that that's really all the Heat do. From what I've seen, they play great defense and they're shooting three pointers all game long. You know, and like you got Bam sometimes playing playing the boards, and and Jimmy Butler sometimes driving the hole. But you're really looking at a defensive and a three point team. So that's why you don't really miss. Kendrick Nunn when he's not there, um, or or you know, or, or or some of these other players that aren't getting you know as many minutes as you thought. But when you're looking at guys like like even Dame uh, Lillard last night with his dislocated finger, I haven't really heard what the prog you know like what the prognosis is. Is he going to be out? Is he going to no, come right back? Or? He's already said I'm playing in the next game. Just flat oh, okay. out. Reporter asked him, and he was like, "I am one thousand percent playing." Like and no it, doubt, it, I'm playing. Yeah, and it was in his. It wasn't in his shooting hand. So, dribbling, driving, all that stuff to the left is going to be a little bit more difficult for him. But he still has his shooting hand is fine. Um, yeah, I don't know though. I don't know what to blame if I were a Blazers fan last night. They just nothing was going in. <laughs> Everything was missing. And credit to the Lakers defense because even though they lost game one, they still played good defense. They just couldn't hit a bucket. And last night it's. You know, they had no problem hitting buckets. Uh, and then they just got out to a huge lead. And you could tell that everybody was like, all right, this game is done with 10 minutes left. It's just like there's there's no coming back from 30 some odd down. So let's just go ahead and screw it. You know, do you, now for your heat, you think you yeah. had a chance to sweep the Pacers? Um look, I think the Heat are the not because they're my favorite team and, and, and you know, and I love the heat. I'm a deep, I'm a Miami heat diehard fan. I do believe the Miami heat are the best coached basketball team in the NBA right now. Um, I think Popovich has lost a step and I think that Eric Spolstra is clearly the best coach mm -hmm. in the NBA right now. That's my opinion. Um, I, think, now, I think Nick nurse would like to have a word with you. I think you're right. And I do remember, I think the last time we did the show together, or maybe the second to last time we did the show together, you predicted a, a, a I'm not even sure you predicted a playoff appearance for the Toronto uh, Raptors, but you definitely had them low on the seeding list. Yep. Um, you know, and, and look, they're an impressive uh, team. Um, but the Heat are not a very talented basketball team, in my opinion. Uh, well, you got, you got so many young guys that it's kind of hard yeah. to project outward. You know what? Did anybody talk about Bam two years ago? But I mean, we all loved Bam because it was a pretty, you know, we thought that, that was a good pick. Um, you know, he has good pedigree, but I'm talking about Duncan Robinson. Like that's Duncan Robinson is the embodiment of the Miami Heat. He's yep. like a G League guy. I think he's in his second year. Um, he was the undrafted. Um, yeah, he doesn't have the pedigree of like a Tyler Harrow from what Kentucky. And right. none was, you know, he was a G League guy that you guys. Was, uh, look, yeah, he was on Golden State's G League team. Yeah, our entire roster outside of the Gorich, uh, the Goron uh, Dragic uh, a pickup that we did like, like four or five years back from, from Phoenix um, and Jimmy Butler. And, you know, Andre Iguodala is not who he used to be, even though he's actually been playing no. okay. You know, uh, I'm, like I'm not embarrassed when I see him on the, you know, on the court. Um, Olenek, 
is a backup guy. He's playing okay, you know, but the, the Heat are a potpourri, a hodgepodge of mediocre players. And somehow, you know, with the exception of Jimmy Butler, Jimmy Butler is a legitimate, bona fide all star player. Yes, he but is. But aside from that, you have a bunch of guys that are just a bunch of guys, you know, like maybe a, a step above, um, you know, Caruso, but still, like, you know, still a bunch of dudes out there. You know, um, so will they sweep the Pacers? I wouldn't bet on it, you know, because a team like that can get beat any night and they can go on a bad streak any like, you know, for for a few days, because when they get behind, if the threes aren't falling for them, it's very tough for them to score. Um, yeah. So I think they can lose any night. <clears throat> you know, um, the Heat are susceptible to getting their butts kicked almost any night. But. They're mentally a very disciplined football, uh, from, Jesus, a basketball team, and um, and you better get ready for them because they're going to play super smart basketball, and all of the players know what they're supposed to be doing, and if they execute their game plan, it's actually quite a beautiful thing to watch. I mean, they're a they're a pretty basketball team uh, um, scheme scheme wise. Um, if you watch the games, like they're they're doing the plays, they're like. Mm-hmm. They seem very well coached to me. Oh, they are. Spolstra is one of the best coaches in the league. You know, there's a a handful that you can say that you're envious of. I wish I had on my team. Him, I'll still take Pop, Nick Nurse. Uh, uh, Why am I blanking all of a sudden? (laughs) Maybe not. Rick Carlisle. um, What about the guy in Phoenix? What about the guy in Phoenix? um... It's, look... They rattled off eight straight wins, but look at the rest of the season. Like, where where does this eight wins genuinely come from? Is it that uh, the only thing that I can point to is the biggest difference between now and then is Ubre was out of was not playing. He was mm. he was hurt, so he wasn't starting anymore. So they ended up giving those minutes to Cam Johnson and Mikael Bridges has already basically cemented his starting status. But it's Cam Johnson's a better you know spot shooter. Whereas Ubre needs to kind of play make uh, to get his shots, and you know he's the second leading scorer on the team. But perhaps it's we just need one of those playmaking guys in Devin Booker, and we need to surround him with shooters and Aiton type of thing. And everybody else, when you're open and you find your spots, you take your shot. As opposed to we kick it over to you, and now you're trying to play make over on your side, and it pushes Devin Booker out you know, to basically wait on the wings. I don't know though. I need to go like a deep dive to see the full difference in the numbers and all that stuff. Because when I did it throughout their, their run, it's like, there's not a, tra- a lot of people were pointing to saying, well, Booker made the leap. And if you look at his stats, they're not dramatically different in this eight game stretch than they were. He's throughout the regular like season. He's always been like that. Booker's yeah. always been, you know, Booker's has he made a, a leap this season compared to last season? Yes. Yes, he has. But there wasn't like another leap from this, you know, regular season into the bubble. He did get a little bit more in, in you know, bump in his points. Like he had a few more high watermark games. Uh, but I, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. But it's it remains to be seen. I, you know, give me, give me a couple of years before I'm willing to anoint you. That's yeah. why I always hate like the coach on year one. They have. They just move into a new situation and their team does well. So they get coach of the year and just like, that is in no way indicative of how good a coach they are. Right. Uh, they made a difference obviously, but I want to see sustained difference type of thing, as opposed to these anomalies within where it's, you know, they, you could look back at coach of the years and be like, all right, you know, that dude's got one, but you know, Dwayne Casey won it in, and then by, you know, in Toronto and then got fired and it was the right move because they won a championship the very next season with a new coach. Right. 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 So coach of the year, <laughs> I think a kind of bullshit award, uh, in that it doesn't always go to the best coach, but I guess you could say that about any, you know, award. A lot of people are saying that Giannis doesn't deserve the MVP or he's not the actual MVP that it's LeBron or someone else. But I think, I think this year um, LeBron's got his best pace in a long time. I do think yeah, LeBron. Yeah, sure. Uh, like if LeBron wins the MVP this year, I would not be surprised in the slightest. I, I think this is by far his best case uh, for for an MVP in a long time. Even though you can argue, and I think it's a good argument, 
that LeBron is the MVP every year um, because there's nobody better than him. And I and I agree with that. I think with the exception of those two Steph Curry years and that one insane Kevin Durant year um, mm-hmm. where he still played for OKC. Yeah. I think it, it, it's you can pretty much make an argument that LeBron should have won MVP all the other years. Um, but well, this year I think is the best one where I think he has the best chance to actually win it. Well, I mean, I, I will agree in that it would be – it'd be surprising to me. You say it wouldn't be surprising. The only reason it'd be surprising to me is – all by and large, all the journalists that I've seen that have released their votes, who they actually submitted on their ballot, they've all chosen Giannis. So if the silent majority ends up being LeBron, then I will be like, wow, that's that's crazy that the 10 so far that I've heard reveal their votes. I think nine really, it's is all, gone. all Giannis, huh? Well, I think it's it's a difference of like, okay, if you need to win one playoff game, you take LeBron. But if you want to win the most games over the course of a regular season, you take Giannis because LeBron doesn't doesn't go that hard every night anymore because he knows that the goal is not to win the regular season, it's to win the postseason. At 35 mm-hmm. years of age, he's got more miles on him with playoff minutes and all that than anybody else in the league, hands down. Yeah. So I think that's the difference. Is LeBron still the best player in the game? It's debatable, but he, given the fact that he's 35 and it's still debatable, that's a hell of a statement. Uh, 17 seasons. It's it's bananas. It's bananas. Uh, LeBron or Carmelo, Carmelo put out a tweet of a picture of the two of them from behind the first time they played in 2003 when he was on the Nuggets and then one from game one of, and you're like, Jesus, man, those two have been in the league for so long. Yeah, yeah, but Melo, look, Melo's had um, a lot of recuperation time over the last three seasons. Yes, you know, where LeBron's been going harder than ever in the last three I mean, look, I know last season he missed half the season with injury, but that season before was, I think, the first time he played all 82 games. I mean, like, yeah. you know, LeBron's a, look, LeBron's a freak of nature. I mean, the guy is so incredibly well kept in terms of his of, of, of his shape. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's so impressive and, and so, like, alien almost. How um, how smart he is about conditioning and is and like keeping his his body ready for for you know for play and I'm sure that that's infectious um, to all of his players you know yep. and like I'm sure that he drives all those guys to be 30 40 percent better than they normally would be because you know um, like ironically the last time AD was in the playoffs I remember him sweeping. You know these pretty much this the same Portland team. I mean, obviously there's you know there's some differences. I think Whiteside being a big difference and stuff like that. But you know Dame and CJ got swept by uh, by AD. Yeah. You know, um, and uh, but AD last night looked looked scary. As somebody who doesn't want the Lakers to win, because I'm still holding a grudge because of LeBron in Miami, even though I know he gave me two championships and and you know look, I think LeBron's an Incredible human being, but do I want to see him lose in his sport? Yes. <laughs> okay. But like, uh, uh, man, AD last night looked scary. I mean, he looked, uh, he was doing everything he's supposed to do. And I think the LeBron is very wise in that he knows that if they're going to win a championship, AD needs to lead this. The, he needs to be basically the focus of the offense and the guy that they rely on in those minutes. Obviously, AD is going to lean on LeBron because LeBron has the experience. He's won numerous championships. He's been finals MVP. He knows what these high pressure situations are, but it's also LeBron knows that I can't log the intensity of all those minutes like someone that's younger can. So basically like I can shift in and out of gears as needed and AD, we need to rely on you. And if, you know, game one, Outside of the restricted zone, AD was not shooting well. There in the line, he ended up with a decent amount of points, but he was bricking from anywhere outside of 10 feet. And it yeah. his shot was just rimming out. It's one of those of everybody has a bad night, and the Lakers collectively had a bad night outside of LeBron, by and large, in game one. But last night, like that right baseline where we began to drive, I think it was on white side, and he did a little 180 because he had a, his back to him, or 270-ish, 
and then stopped and then did a step back. And that's one of those where the step back doesn't look like a travel because it's in the fluidity of, of the guy's movement. And then just buries this gorgeous little 14, 15 foot mid range from the baseline. It's like, dude, if you got a seven footer, they can do that. Like that's, that's just not fair. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and, and <clears throat> I do think AD has a little bit of the nice guy syndrome. There's something about him that seems pretty like nice. You know, he doesn't seem like to be a guy out there looking, looking for blood um, or, or, or having that kind of Jimmy Butler attitude that you better get out of my way because I'm coming to crush you. Um, you know, every play. Um, yeah. But AD like, little- that, that's bit Jimmy in the ass now a couple times. Sure. But I think sure. it's, I, I think it's, you know, it's the perfect marriage for the heat because that is heat culture to a T of you are not coming in out of shape. We're going to weigh you like it's some weird beauty pageant in the fifties. and You can't be <laughs> over a certain kind of weight type of thing. Like they fat shame. Have you ever heard the stories of yeah. oh, Shaq yeah. greasing himself up to make himself look skinnier when they go in for those weigh-ins as if that's going to help ho- at all. Oh, Riley's a dictator when it comes. Oh, to he is. Yeah. And that's yeah, yeah. honestly Jimmy and every quote from Jimmy is, you know, I saw one where he was specifically asked like, why, why do you get along in the heat? Why do you think this heat culture works for you so well? And he's like, you want to know why? Is because when somebody, when I see a teammate doing wrong, I will tell him, hey, you're fucking up and you're screwing it up for all the rest of us. And it, because it's heat culture, when I screw up, they better tell me that I'm fucking up and screwing right. it up for the rest of the team. And you're like, yeah, if you buy into that type of atmosphere, then it's just going to feed into, you know, it's a, uh, it, it works for very specific people. Dion Waiters, not so much. You know what I mean? Dion wants to take his edibles and go sit on a yacht and just play basketball. He wants, you know, it's Iverson. We're talking about right, so look, first of all, first of all, you made my point so eloquently in a way that I can never hope to articulate. That is the core difference between Miami or Heat basketball, and I, and I think winning basketball versus what the Lakers have on their hands. I think the Lakers on their hands have a culture of potential coddling, right? Look, I mean, that's yeah. where, you know, that's where Dion Waiters ended up, you know? Um, they have this culture of, yeah, it's a coddling type of situation where emotions and drama um, are focused on as important things. And I think the Blazers are the eighth seed. They had to do a play-in game to even make the playoffs. You know, they had to run off. I believe they went six and two in the bubble to even have a chance to make the playoffs. They had to go on a run. This isn't a a team that is supposed to compete on any level for a championship. Well, I I think they just got Nurkic back. Like they're they've had health and injury issues. You know, Rodney Hood is out for the season, and they could thoroughly use his extra scoring off the bench, but getting Nurkic back and Zach Collins uh, back to healthy. Um, although he didn't play in that last game, at least that I saw um, I, it, ta- it changes who they are now. Had Memphis gotten in or Phoenix or any of the, uh, these others, I think your point is valid in that. Like, you know, the Lakers should be able to curb stomp any of those teams. Whereas Portland, I mean, Think of how many iconic game-winning shots you've ever seen in the playoffs. Dame has two of them. Two a 10, two a 15. Like, they're a different animal. In the last five, six years, maybe. Uh, no, no, no. Think about it. Against Houston, that one that was a deep yeah, 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 shoot off yeah. of. That was before. In that announced him. In 2014. You're right. In 2014. And then last year, the bye-bye. The bye-bye. The bye-bye yeah. And then the – Dude, that's – OKC. I guess OKC, yeah. yeah. With and then Paul George, you know, right before the playoffs started, talking about you're going right, to get bounced this right. year and be like, and dude, the I, bench, I, I sent you the home bench early. picture and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, Damon Lillard. Look, there's a lot of pundits that I follow that I, you know, that I respect. Mainly Stephen A. Smith, who's like, you know, my, uh, you know, my favorite one. Like Stephen A. Smith the other day said that he thinks Damon Lillard might be the best player in the world right now. Okay, um, well then, it's a little bit, it's a little bit intense. Yeah. Who do you think the best player in the world is right now? In this given second? I mean, it's hard to go against either LeBron or Kawhi. Right. Just because I think those those two teams have the best shot of winning a championship, you know, 
Milwaukee, it's they won. They lost game one. They won last night, but Chris Middleton had a terrible game. Yeah, what's and it's going like, on with that guy? I don't know. In the playoffs, when he plays the Celtics, that dude is a killer. For whatever reason, when he plays the Celtics, it is lights out. And then against uh, apparently everybody else in the playoffs, you have no idea. It's a crapshoot what you're going to get from them. And if they can't get any reliability in their second guy, then I don't give them much of a chance to win against any legitimate team. Like right now, I like Toronto and Boston better than I like Milwaukee. Even if Milwaukee takes the next you know three games and they win 4-1, I still think those teams are playing better basketball right now. Uh, you know, Toronto won today, so they're up 3-0 on theirs. I figured the Nets could steal one in that series. Um, so, but, yeah, I mean, like, look, if I had to, like, place my ballot and, and vote honestly about who the best player in the world is right now, I'd probably go with LeBron also. You know, as much as, like, it's just Steph's not playing, KD's not playing, yeah. um, you know, uh, Giannis um, doesn't have, I think, a good enough of an outside shot to really be as scary as LeBron is. In, like, I think LeBron is scarier inside than Giannis is inside. And I think LeBron can shoot better from the outside, better yeah. than Giannis can shoot from the outside. Yeah, no and question Le there. And LeBron's a way better passer. Even though I have seen Giannis, especially last night, um, actually starting to pass the ball more, you know, like, um, or, or, it just seemed that he was incorporating that into his game a little bit better. Um, but yeah, look, LeBron, man, it's, it's, it's fascinating um, that at his age and his minutes played, because he's not that old. 35 is actually pretty young, but it, it's the fact that he has well, so much miles on his, on his legs. Yeah, but 35 against 22, where... Right. 22 has all the energy. They don't have the injury history that they're carrying with them. They don't have the weird quirks that build up of, you know, over the years, plus the the amount of miles and whatnot. I can't imagine what the cartilage in his knees and hips look like after all the running that he has done and jumping and everything else over these years. And he's still performing at the most elite of levels, which is it's crazy. Amazing. It's amazing. It, it, look, okay. it truly is astounding. Out of the two conferences, who do you see making the finals? It's a tough one. Uh, the East is very tough for me. Um, so it, starting in the West, I, I'll i be honest with you, I don't know enough and I haven't seen enough minutes of Utah and Denver to really gauge what their competitive level could be against some of the teams that I watch more like the Lakers, the Clippers, and uh, the Rockets. Sure. I'd say th those three teams in the West, I've seen a lot more than the Jazz and uh, Denver. Because, like, right now, to be honest with you, man, I couldn't even tell you what the Jazz and Denver series are even at in terms of, like uh, – It's 1-1 one, one right now. 1-1. One, 1-1. One. One, one. Yeah. So, um, I think in the West, it's it's – I want it to be the Clippers, um, but I haven't seen great gameplay out of Kawhi yet this this playoff you okay. know, run. Um, um, I mean, I'll tell you who I have seen great play out of is that Luka Doncic guy is just unbelievable. And, you know, um, and, and Christoph Porzingis is actually playing really good basketball as well. Hey, you know, had so he not gotten tossed? Dallas could be up 2-0 right now. Yeah, and, and like, what's the thing that they have? Porter? No. no uh, now, Porter's on Denver. Yeah, yeah, Porter's on Denver. Who, who's the other kid that they have? Um, uh, they got Seth Curry, Trey Burke, Maxi Kleba, Dorian Finney-Smith, Tim Hardaway Jr. Tim Hardaway Jr. Tim Hardaway Jr. has played really well also. He's been shooting a lot of threes. Um, you know, Dallas is like – looking pretty damn good. So, like, I can see the Clippers having a little bit of trouble with them. But anyway, to answer your question, for me, it's either the Lakers or the Clippers. You know, like, if you're kind of honest about projecting who can make it all the way through, it, it, it's it's going to be that, you know, that L, you know, that all L.A., which is really a shame, man, because to have that Subway series or whatever, you, you know, whatever the analog yeah. is, um, would have been a beautiful thing to experience here in L.A., um, you know, with, like, the L.A. crowd 
um, vying for their champion, whether it's the Clippers or the you know the Lakers. Now it's going to be in a bubble, and we're not going to we kind of get robbed that. But I do think that the seeding worked out perfectly for them to have that Clippers Lakers uh, you know face off in the in the Western Conference Finals. So that's yeah. what I'm still sticking to. Um, there's people that tell me that Donovan Mitchell is the truth and that the Jazz could sneak in there. Um, yeah, I don't buy that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, look, I'm, I'm uh, Russell Westbrook's one of my favorite players in the NBA. And if Russell Westbrook could get his, uh, could get back on the court and him and Harden could really mesh with this crazy, uh, you know, Dan Tony coaching style, I think they could have a chance to, to you know, go on a run. Um, but I'm going to go Lakers Clippers and I'll give the edge to the Clippers because they're supposed to have the edge, right? They're supposed to be better. You know, they got better coaching. They got deeper bench. Lou Williams is back. Um, they got, you know, they have Paul George, um, and, um, Kawhi. They're both young. They're both, you know, at the top of their game, Mm -hmm. they're supposed to have the edge. I just don't see that same level of hunger that I saw in Toronto last, you know, last year that was just like Toronto was just a scary team. They just, you know, they just refused to lose. Yeah. Um, where I don't see that same level of aggression coming from the Clippers. Uh, what about in the East? Are you a true homer and just saying my Heat are going to win out and we're going to be in the finals? I don't think the Heat – if the Heat make it to the semifinals, they're either going to be playing Milwaukee. Um, basically, they're playing Milwaukee the next round, I think. It's pretty much um, no matter what happens. I don't have the brackets in front of me. But yeah, I believe it would be the winner of the 4-5 because then it's the winner of 2-7 plays the winner of 3-6. So 1-8 plays 4-5. So then I'll bring um, it up really quick. Um, yeah, so you would have Milwaukee. In the next round, right? Yes, in round two. Yeah, there's no way we're beating Milwaukee. There's no way we're beating Milwaukee. I don't know. If Milwaukee keeps playing to the degree that they're playing. I, it's conceivable. You have yeah, nobody yeah, but- that could stop Giannis. But then after that, it's like, I don't know. If Chris Middleton doesn't play well, Look well, at the Heat actually here? have a decent record against Milwaukee this season. They've actually won some games against Milwaukee this season. You know, even before the uh, the COVID thing hit. Um, but yeah, I don't think. I mean, Giannis is a is is the MVP, right? And like, gotta be yeah, two times. You know, the Heat are a bunch of undersized G leaguers. You know, like even Bam, who's like I think a great player, is an undersized five man. He's not like I think he's six nine, six ten. You know he's the, he's that prototypical sort of power forward size dude, you know, but he's playing that center, you know, that center position. Um, but look, man, if the Heat get hot on the three point, they're the closest thing you got right now, I think, to Golden State when it comes to just being able to kick your ass with the three pointer. Um, if they get hot with that three pointer, it's it's scary. Yeah, it's well, scary. I mean, Duncan Robinson is. I don't know that he can replicate last night, you know, three or four times within a seven game series, but it's conceivable. So if you have that weapon in your arsenal, then you're going to be a threat night and night. It's like Houston. When you look at Houston, if you look at the box scores of the games that they play, they get out rebounded now with this small lineup every night does not matter. And I think so far against OKC, they've shot fewer free throws uh, but what's killed OKC, especially in game one, is turnovers, which is something they don't normally do. But Houston's big variable is we're going to shoot minimum 53s, 50. All we need to do is hit right. 34 to 35% of these. And it's now insane. It's insane. Yeah, they shot 52 in game one, I believe 56 in game two. That's a shitload of threes. And even yeah. with Eric Gordon going 0 for 10, the bench and everybody else stepped up and made up for his and Harden just piss poor shooting from three because they're launching, launching so many, there's still 38 or so other threes coming from other players. PJ Tucker goes four, four and uh, you know, guys are shooting 40, 50 
percent and above that aren't named Harden or Eric Gordon, and they're going to shoot that volume of threes, they're a tough fucking out. So yeah, it's the same so, with so, the Heat. If you're going to shoot a shitload of threes, so long as you make 36% or better, it's going to be damn near impossible to take you out. I mean, look, so it, so um, I think Milwaukee pulls through over the Magic. Miami pulls through against Indy. Um, I think Milwaukee beats you know Miami. Like if I had to honestly bet on it, I would bet Milwaukee sure. or Miami. Um, then Toronto, Boston, um, that's going to be a hell of a matchup. I know. I can't uh, wait for that. Uh, um, I mean, look, I also, again, with the injury stuff, I have questions about Gordon Hayward. Is he going to play? Uh, he's basically done. He's done, huh? Well, he rolled his end. So they're calling it a grade three sprain, I believe. But he's done for, he's out for four weeks. And he already announced before the bubble began that he's leaving in September for the birth of his son. So, and it's like the middle right. of September. So right when this four weeks is up and he could be healthy enough to play, he'll be leaving again anyway. So in essence, he's out for five weeks. That's insane. All right. So then you've got to give the edge to Toronto, in my opinion. So then you have a Toronto-Milwaukee conference final. And I, I'll tell you something, man. If Milwaukee isn't ready to play, Toronto will beat them. Oh, kick the shit out of them last year. Yeah. And, and you have then a potential Clippers Toronto finals um, that would be incredible. Actually. Be epic. You know, especially because Toronto could win that. Toronto could win that, and the Kawhi Leonard narrative could forever be altered. Um, yeah, or cemented if the Clippers. Or cemented. Win. Yeah. yeah. I think whoever yeah. wins that Toronto Boston series takes the East. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you, you don't have much faith in the Bucs, huh? They're just so inconsistent right now. Now, so far, my predictions have either been pretty close to accurate or wildly incorrect. I have not been in the middle where it's like, how oh, close? <laughs> it's either been, yes, this is exactly what I was anticipating or like the OKC Houston. I'm OKC does not look like they have a chance in hell at winning this, whereas I thought they could legitimately win it in seven. Uh, right. So I could very easily be wrong, Milwaukee. Milwaukee fans, I am not hating because I, I would love to see Milwaukee make this push because then it, it increases the chances of Giannis staying in a small market. And right, which I actually have heard, and obviously this is normal that you're going to hear this from like Miami uh, uh, fanboys, but I've been hearing a lot of talk about uh, Giannis to Miami. Well, yes, it's coming from Miami fanboys. <laughs> right. But at the same time, Riley has, in essence, said we're keeping our cap space for his free agency because we are going to make a push to get Giannis. They're not going to go out this year and make a stupid move just to bolster the roster for coming next season. They're looking for the season afterwards, uh, which is smart. Because Look, Miami could be a perfect place for him. Oh, yeah, good spin. Good spin. Of course, it could. <laughs> it's fucking Miami. Who doesn't love Miami? Every player that goes there loves Miami. Outside of also, the culture of the team is what turns off any player. But the city itself, everybody seems to love. Look, but I think that culture, though, is actually perfect for Young. No, he's got that mentality, yes. And I think that that would be the way to get him. Because, like, you know LeBron is, like, whispering in the ear of Jeannie Buss and saying, hey, we got to go get Giannis if you, if you really want to win. Because with me and AD, it's not enough. you got to stack the deck even higher um, for us to guarantee that championship. So you know they're going to make – they're going to figure something out and try to make a push uh, and offer him all the, you know, the glitz and the glamour of Los Angeles. But where Miami could offer Giannis that kind of stoic – uh, discipline that I think Giannis is really comfortable with. And, and you're right, Miami as a city is also a very, very international city where, you know, his Greek family can feel very at home mm -hmm. um, because that's what Miami's all about, right? It's like it's about all of the countries hanging out together. Um, I think there's a good shot that Giannis could uh, could be in that uh, in that red and black next season. Yeah, exactly. I I hear this a lot from Heat fanboys. <laughs> you know what? I think he'd be good. Right. Where is this? What? Oh, tell me, Swami. Where do you foresee? Right. Oh, isn't that amazing? Yeah. It benefits your team. Now, look. If I do, 
the best situation, in no, in no way do I want this to happen, but for Giannis, the most intriguing and the best basketball would be Golden State. That because, would be incredible. I mean, look, they have that second pick. They have that second pick. Which they'll be getting rid of, but you have two ready-made shooters that are more than happy to exist without the ball, but you'd have driving lanes for days because they can't pack the paint because they can't get off of. So that offense would be flat out unstoppable in a different way than it was when Durant was there, you know, because Durant extends the floor even more, but now it's Giannis. If they even remotely collapse, it'd be like, okay, well now you got to deal with clay and Steph and then Wiggins, another good perimeter defender who shoots, he can get hot himself, but now the pressure will be utterly and completely off of him having to do anything. Now in no way am I saying I want that to happen. I want him to stay in Milwaukee. Uh, mm. Just because small market teams get screwed over for as, as much as every time. Every yeah. Time. I mean, look, Kawhi and PG joined a team in LA. It wasn't the Lakers, but it was a team in LA and Kevin Durant and Kyrie went to New York. It wasn't the Knicks, but it's still New York. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, those, a lot of those players were in smaller markets, Kawhi in Toronto, PG and OKC, you know, it's it's unfortunate for all the smart market teams. So either they win by drafting and creating a team and do it with their homegrown talent, or they don't at all because they're not attracting free agents. What when is the end? What when is the final supposed to end? Uh, October. Because isn't that when the new season usually starts? I mean, because I always remember yeah. the Halloween game is like, you know, it's always a fun game. Are they going to try to start the season at the same time, or are they going to delay no. the start? No, right? No way. Originally, it was pushed to the beginning of December, but yesterday, Adam Silver was uh, – Rachel Nichols asked him, you know, how are we looking for that beginning of December? And he's like, See, it's kind of looking a little early just because the whole point is to have fans again because they're losing a lot of revenue without oh, the game. At, um, I know this isn't a baseball show, man, but, like, those baseball games, like, they have to be losing money every single pitch. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. At least the NBA, it's, you know, they get more money from, they still make, you know, it's like a million dollars a game that an owner clears on a playoff game. And at least, at the very least in the first round, they clear a million, um, which is excellent money. I'm not denigrating that, but baseball, you need the full hundred and whatever ridiculous number of games it is to justify these massive contracts because yeah. it's not like they sell out every game. There's a bunch of those games where it's half, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, less. Baseball. yeah, yeah. It's yeah. a pastime. It's like a pastime. Um, okay, so then are they gonna shorten the season or have no, we forever really. changed the timing of of the uh, basketball season? They're, yeah, they're just gonna push the start. It'll be a full season. Now I don't know if it, they'll then condense it uh and increase like back to backs, but I can't imagine they'll do that. I mean, for years, owners and League individuals wanted to push the start of the season until December anyway, preferably Christmas Day, because that's been their marquee event. But no one pays attention before Christmas. And you're up against the NFL for so long. Right, right. Your ass handed to you. So why not just get out of the NFL's way? Uh, so maybe this pushes it going forward. Now, the flip side of that is now the championship is going to land even further in the summer when fewer people are watching. But maybe you make up for it with extra increased regular season watching and your main competition then for a third of the season is going to be baseball and they beat baseball when they go head to head. So yeah, I don't know, but cause they still have to do the draft and free agency plus give, you know, any team that makes it in the playoffs deep enough time to rest before we start a new season. So originally it was going to be like the first week of December, somewhere around there. And now I don't know, they haven't speculated, but, I'm guessing, you know, they push, given what Adam Silver said, to maybe middle of December to late December. Wow. And still have an 82-game season. Still have a full season, yes. That is wow. not going to change. Well, they're See, I, money this year. We're I'd tech- probably condense it. I'd probably condense it just to get my schedule back on track. Um, I probably would, would cut it to, like, a 60-game season or whatever the equivalent would be if we started in December. You might end up getting that because now they're talking about making the play-in game a potential fixture going forward because it just created so much excitement and the ratings were excellent, you know, for that type of game. Now, excellent by modern standards. It's not like this is Monday Night Football 30 years ago when you have no other options on television type of thing. Right, right. Uh, But for two relatively non-marquee teams, Portland has more, but it's not like Memphis draws eyes. 
did really well in the ratings, but the whole build up to that was great. And it was the talk of sports, you know, talking head shows, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for a solid week there. Um, but you might end up getting that condensed season for years. People have been pushing to get like a 70 to 72 game season. Maybe that happens now going forward. Uh, yeah. I don't know. COVID's created a lot of oh wrinkles. Oh, my God. It's been a disaster. But yes, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? <laughs> Bless you. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, anything, any uh, parting shots uh, before you want to get out of here? Um, look, um, I can see LeBron becoming a, the, the president of the United States more than I can see these Lakers winning a championship. Um, and look, I actually do think LeBron is going to be very successful after his career. And I, I actually do kind of see him going into politics. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the Lakers, I think, are, are going to have a tough time overcoming the drama that gets built inside of that locker room. That I do believe LeBron is a big um, sort of prognosticator of. I do think LeBron likes a little bit of drama. You know, um, I do think so. And it's not something that's new. It's something that's been going on for pretty much his entire career. You know, from when he ripped off the shirt, you know, um, in that game against, the, I forget if it was the Magic or, or, or the Celtics, but that famous symbolic i'm ripping off the shirt um you know oh, having to wear it from cleveland the first time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. exactly from cleveland um to to his game in uh against the mavericks where the heat should have swept that team and like they just got in their own head and turned into this turnover machine that just got their butts kicked in the finals you know the heat should have swept that mavericks team i mean the mavericks were pretty good but the heat should have swept their ass you know? yeah, but it's also first year together and sure, sure. But know. there was some drama there to the, you know, to pop and the AC and, and all of these other things. Um, and in Cleveland, so the drama has been with him the whole time. Um, and I do think that being stuck in this bubble, no family, no fans, uh, it, it, it's, it's going to be a lot psychologically, for the Lakers to overcome. Sure. Um, I do see them advancing throughout the playoffs. I don't see them winning the West. Um, I think it's going to be between, um, I think it'll be between uh, the Clippers, um, you, uh, the, the Clippers, the Rockets, maybe Utah, Denver. I, like, I got to learn more about that. But um, I, uh, look, I'm excited that basketball is back. But I look, like again, I'm contradicting myself because I do feel like the best game I saw so far in the bubble was Lakers Blazers game one, right? Like 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 that felt to me the most like a super exciting like basketball game that I've come oh, yeah. accustomed to. It was you back know, and like, forth. Yeah, you know, especially those last five minutes, it was really fun basketball, you know, because the Lakers had it. And then they started stumbling just a little bit, and the and the Blazers were capitalizing on the mistakes, and it was a it became like that eleven I think it was eleven one run there at the end, um, you know to win that game. So I love that kind of basketball. Um, where last night was just like an ass kicking. But anyway, oh, so pathetic. It was so bad. Look, I'm very proud of the Heat. They're kind of like you know very similar to the old Miami Dolphins, sort of no name defense. This is like the no-name playoff team that's 2-0. and You know, like, you're right. Outside of Jimmy Butler, I, I, I bet you nobody can even name a player on the Heat. Maybe Bam. You yeah, know, but, just the, the average person on the street, and they may not even know Jimmy Butler. Like, they've heard the name, but they don't know who plays for the Heat. This is a collection of disparate parts that Spolster has playing a beautiful game together. Yeah, yeah. So, look, man, I'll, I'll keep watching. I'll keep texting you during the games, and – yeah. And uh, I'm always know. watching, baby. <laughs> and thanks for having me on the show, as always. No, thanks for coming on. Uh, thank you for making the time. Uh, and hopefully everything keeps continuing, you know, on the positive trajectory on your end. And uh, good you. luck to your heat. Uh, 
Yeah. I don't know that you have a shot, but you guys are really fun to watch. And I like this young core and going forward, you suddenly are going to be a threat in the East for the next three, four, five years for sure. Especially when Giannis comes to town. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Just keep driving that bandwagon. You know what I mean? There's, there's quite a few of you on Twitter. You know what I'm hearing? Well, what you're are you here, hearing? You all right. <laughs> I'm yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, inside sources tell me what inside right, right. sources you have. You don't. You don't. It's not like you got some cousin in Greece that knows the Antetokounmpo right. family. It's a bunch yeah. of horse shit. But yeah. good for you. Um, maybe it puts it in Giannis's mind, and he starts thinking about like that's potentially where it germinates uh, from. Who knows? But yeah, yeah, yeah. Riley's good very good at that kind of propaganda, it's sort of seeding that stuff out there. There you go. Uh, well, yeah, good luck to your heat. Good luck to uh, the Giannis sweepstakes for you guys. Uh, if that ever comes to fruition and, uh, you know, perhaps the Lakers won't make it out of the, the West and, uh, you'll get doubly treated. So there what, you go. What's your, what's your final, uh, you know, prediction in terms of the team's playing? I think in best of seven, it's nobody's beating mm -hmm. the Clippers in the West. Okay. Um, even, even though they have looked a little uneven and Dallas could be up two zero right now, the depth and the playoff pedigree and championship pedigree of Kawhi Leonard, it proved last year that he can take guys that have never done it before and win a championship. Now it's also Golden State had a bunch of, you know, ill-timed injuries, but that's what happens right. to champions every year. And so, Doc Rivers is a great leader. So, yeah, he is. Yeah. He knows how to yeah. manage high, you know, high caliber talent like that. X's and O's, he may not be the best coach, but he knows how to deal with players. And that is a skill in and of itself. So that, and then, like I said, whoever wins the Toronto Boston in the East in the next round, I think takes the East. Once again, I could be wildly wrong, but I think those two teams are the most completely constructed of the the teams in the East. So we shall see. All right, cool. Uh, and thanks to everybody that chimed in on the chat. I didn't get a chance to. We didn't get a chance to read those because we were having a nice discussion, but. Octane said when Danny Green hit a three, he knew the game was over. That's true because Lakers has been Laker fans have been dragging Danny Green this entire bubble experience. Oh man, it's been bad. It's been yeah, bad. Josh A says LeBron is forty five in NBA years. That's probably true. And then Andy Ortiz, right before we close this out, just says Dirk with right. twenty seven exclamation points. And who doesn't love Dirk? Right. Uh, right. All right. Well, that is it for today's uh, drop and dimes. Once again, thank you, Mark, for coming on. Thank you for having me, sir. Not a problem. We'll have to get you back on before this playoffs uh, ends. Yeah. Perhaps, perhaps in the second round, once the Heat have uh, made it a hell of a series against the Bucks. Yeah. But we got a lot of basketball in store. All right, that is it for today's Friday edition of Dropping Dimes. Uh, you can follow me anywhere at Matt Knows. Follow him anywhere at Mark Fernandez. Make sure to subscribe to the feed of your choice. Uh, leave a comment below if you're watching this on YouTube. And that is it today. Adios. Adios.